Okay, so I stopped at this point where I said names are bound to objects and I think that is somewhat confusing. So I am going to elaborate a bit on that. So getting back to names are bound to objects. So let us say clear, I say A is 1. Now A is a name which is bound, so there is a 1 object. So the instant I did this, 1, an integer has been created and sitting somewhere in memory. This name A is associated with that, okay, it is as simple as that. Now I say B is equal to A, so B is 1, okay. Now if I say A is 2, what do you expect to happen to B? B is actually 1, because when I do B equals A, B is now a name bound to the object to which A is bound. A is bound to 1, I say B is equal to A which means I have another name B which is referring to the same object. So now if I change A to something else, B does not change because B is still hanging on to 1. So is that clear? So basically forget about the notion of pointers and C++ references and things like that. Just keep in mind that a name, any name is simply a name that is bound to an actual object sitting somewhere. <coughs> so in Python there are two basic kinds of data types. So basically there are a bunch of basic objects like numbers, floating point, integers, long, complex numbers, strings, tuples, lists, dictionaries, functions, classes, so on and so forth. So these are basic object types. The types are classified further into two. They are called mutable types and immutable types. Now immutable types are like numbers, strings, the special type called none and tuples. Immutables cannot be changed in place. So think of the number 1. <clears throat> you can't change 1, right? 1 is 1. On the other hand, you think of something like a list. I have not introduced the notion of a list, but think of a list. I can add something to a list. I can remove elements from a list. So I can actually change the object fundamentally. Immutables are those which cannot be changed. So numbers. Um, Strings in Python are immutables, which means you cannot change a string. You can only create new strings. You can't change a string in place. There is a special type called none, which basically means nothing. It's 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 none. So it's a special object called none. And you'll find that it's an extremely useful object when you're doing programming in Python. And there are tuples. Tuples are collections of objects but you can't change the tuple itself. Mutable types like lists, dictionaries, instances of object, of classes, etc. are mutable and they can be changed. Okay. So I think as I talk, you will see that I use the word object. So what is an object? So you need to understand what we mean by an object. So basically, I am going to give you a loose and informal but pretty handy description. Computer scientists forgive me for looseness, but this is a useful description. An object is a particular instance of a general class of things. So here is a simple concrete example. Consider the class of cars made by the Honda company. The notion of a car or a Honda Accord is not, does not give you a car. But the actual car you see on the road is a particular instance of a Honda class. Right? So you have a Honda Accord. It is a particular type of car and you have the notion of a Honda Accord. So every time you see a Honda Accord, you can actually say, yes, this is a Honda Accord. That is not a Honda Accord, so on and so forth. But the actual Honda car sitting, standing in front of you is a particular instance of that general notion. So objects are basically these things that you have and they, they have certain properties. So an object is a general term that is used all over the place in Python. So you just understand this kind of loose description. Why are objects important? The reason is 
just like your Honda car, you can create objects on in Python in a programming language. And this object has two things. It has attributes. So for example, you can have the color of your Honda car, the power of the engine, the seat type, for example, you can say it's leather or what is the upholstery, whether you have a music system inside or you don't, so on and so forth. So these are attributes of that car, features of that car. And then you have behavior. The fact that a car behaves in a particular way, that you have an accelerator which you can push, you have a door which you can open, and you, you interact with that car based on that behavior. So in an object-oriented programming language, the same idea holds. You create objects, objects that contain some kind of data, which represents their attributes or their state, and they have what are called methods which are kind of like, which are functions that are associated with this object that give it a particular behavior. So is that clear? Basically an object has some attributes, some state, some data, and it has what are called methods that let you do something with that object, which means you have behavior. And the example is kind of complete, even if you look at any object around you, it's an object. So it has attributes, it has a particular behavior. You can think of anything in this manner. Now the reason this is important is when we write programs, especially more sophisticated and complicated programs, we think object oriented. We don't, we don't explicate it, but we always think, we think in terms of, okay, there's a point here, the point is moving here. You don't think of an XYZ triplet that's moving from here to there or something in some coordinate system. You abstract it and you call it something and you denote it, you give it a name. Same way, you create objects. So ideally, you want to create a programming language where you program in the same sense. You create objects and you make these objects interact with each other. So that's the idea about object-oriented programming and why it makes a difference. So basically, programmers create objects and manipulate them through methods to get things done. So in Python, everything is an object. Okay? And don't really worry about it. Just have the idea that it's an object. And if you ever need to go back and understand it, think of real objects. They have, they have state and they have behavior. That's pretty much it. So we'll get back to classes and things later, but this notion of an object is very powerful and very useful. So let's get on to numbers. So the first is integers. So you can say A is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, minus 1, so on and so forth. But integers have a fixed binary representation, which means yes, there's some integer beyond which you can't go. But Python has a special type called long, which you create by saying integer followed by a capital L, as you see here. These are of any length. And if you're writing pure Python code, if an integer overflows, it becomes a, it becomes a long automatically. So if you actually create something and say A is one, and for loop it forever, it will just go longer and longer and longer and longer. No problems. Python will work with that. Okay. So longs can be as long as you want. Then you can create floating point, which is basically similar to the double precision number in C. There's only one floating type, float type in basic Python. And then you have complex numbers. And each of these is straightforward. The floating point numbers can be created either standard decimal notation or you can create it with an exponential notation. Um, as I said, you can use Python as, an, as, an, as a calculator. You can multiply these basic types, divide, modulo, reminder, so on and so forth. The print statement basically prints whatever you give it. So if you give it some arbitrary object and the object can be made into a nice string form, it will convert it to a string form and print it. So we will see, you will use print as you go along, it is pretty straightforward. Print has this feature where you give it a comma, you can print multiple arguments. You can say print A, comma B, comma C, comma D. Now the complex data type which I have not described is written by two ways. This is one way, 1 plus 1j. One now C is a complex object and C.tab will show me all the methods. It has 
a real attribute and an imaginary attribute. Okay. I could also say C is complex if you do not like the J syntax 1 comma 1. When I type C it converts it to some string form and shows me 1 plus 1 J on screen. There is another there are whole class of these functions called built in functions. So, I, when you start up python you have these built ins all the time. One of them is abs abs which will give you the absolute value of that the magnitude of that complex number. You also have a boolean type in python you define it as true capital T RGV small true will not work right, see here. You can define standard logical operations like not, not of true is false of course or and and okay. and in python these are explicitly written. So, you say not of this not bang okay. like in C. Let us get on to strings. So, strings in python are they have lots of uh, ways in which you can write strings. The first one is a simple string this is a string you see that it is using the back coat single back coat on both sides. It is not left coat and right coat it is the same coat sign. You can embed the other kind of quotes the double coat inside single coat strings and vice versa which means if I could put double quotes reverse with single quotes inside. Okay. And it, it works. Obviously, if you terminate it at a point with the other with this symbol, it ends the string. Okay. So, it is smart enough that it lets you does you do not have to escape the other quotes inside a particular string. Now, if you have a string and you want to span it over multiple lines, you can basically do this. You can say a long string spanning several lines and then you put a backslash in order to escape the string. This is standard just like in C. But this is so common that python has a special type of string called a triple coated string where you do not need to do this. You simply put three quotes. So, I will show you an example. So, let us say s is 1 2 3 I can use this quote or the other quote and then I can type this is a very long string spanning many lines three quotes it is done. So, s is a long string if I say print s I have that entire string. So, it is a convenient way of writing long strings and often your documentation strings are just these long strings. Okay. Now, strings have a bunch of methods and bunch of things you can do with them. So, let us say you define a word the variable word is a name that is bound to a string object which is hello right. So, now I can say 2 times word plus word you it produces hello hello word ok. So, basically if you multiply a string with an integer it multiplies the number of strings, but then what would happen if you multiplied it with a fraction it does not make sense. So, if I did s star 2 I will get two strings, but if I did s star 2.5 I get an error because it does not know what you mean when you say half of a string there is no meaning for that, but it does know what it what it means when you say two strings so just two strings. You can add strings so I can say s plus s that is two strings I can add them <coughs> obviously you cannot subtract strings. So, the other thing you can do with strings is you can index and in general python indexing starts from 0. Okay. So, over here with the word hello word 0 is h word 2 is l word minus 1 is counting from the reverse. So, I will do this a little slowly. So, word is hello. Ah. So, word 0 is h. So, what would word 3 be? L word minus 1 counts from the last very handy. So, it is O. What is word minus 2? L. 
word minus 4 e word minus 100 is an error word 100 is also an error you can see one thing here is python's error reporting mechanism so it says you have an index error so it's a very specific error messages in any programming languages in any programming language please remember that error messages are extremely important and please pay attention to them so when you see an error it has a meaning there's a reason there's a message there here it says the string index is out of range so you clearly know what's wrong that you, you're indexing in a string and it's the wrong value strings are immutable which means i could not say word 0 equals h there's another built in apart from abs abs it's called len it's a very useful built in len of s will give me the length of the string which is 71 len of word is 5 okay you can also define what are called unicode strings i'm not going to go into any depth at all on this but just know that if you have a u prepended here it becomes a unicode string okay so if you specify the code page so on and so forth you can actually type in in multilingual things and the other thing is raw strings and this we will encounter again sometime later so typically in c type strings you have backslash n as a new line so i'll show you that so say s is hello slash n world so if i print this i get hello new line word so slash n is a new line <coughs> sometimes i don't want the slash n to be interpreted as a special character i want it to be the raw string slash n in which case i say r is r hello slash n world oops so if i do print r it prints it as hello world so raw strings let you create strings where you do not automatically convert slash sequences into special characters so slash n slash a slash b they are all special symbols slash t is tab so it will not convert those to specials now strings also have what are called methods so strings are objects so if i create a is hello world and i say a dot starts with so let's see that so s is hello world s dot starts with will return true if s starts with a specific string so if i say starts with hell it returns true does it start with this it doesn't okay same way you have an ends with and then you have what's called upper which means you given a string it will convert it will generate a new string it will not change the string in place it cannot change strings in place because they are immutable so you have a dot upper gives you hello world in caps a dot lower will give it back in lower form a dot split is a special is another method which is very handy which basically splits this sentence based on an argument the default is space so supposing i have a list of words hello world it will split it as two list of the two items hello and word and return a list which we will cover next but the idea is a dot split will split the word split the sentence into words there's another method called join so i'm not going to elaborate this here the other thing that's often useful is doing what is called c style formatting you typically say printf string something is something percentage so on percentage d percentage s and so on the same syntax is supported in python the only difference is you put a percent at the end and then give a tuple of the arguments we will do tuples later but the idea is you put brackets and you say the arguments you want converted and it will convert it so i suggest you try this out later i'm not going to elaborate this but the idea is strings 
are objects that have a bunch of useful methods. They support C style format strings are possible and they support various methods that are very handy to use. The next type we are going to look at is lists, the built in type. Now lists are mutable unlike strings. They are also indexed at 0 which means the first element of a list starts at 0. The last element is minus 1. So, so you can count reverse. The length of a list is always found by len of that list, same built in, just like len of a string. So here are some examples. If I create a list, I can create a list with any kind of items. Unlike other languages like C, you do not have to say a list is just a list of strings. You can put a list of lists, a list of strings, a list of floating points, so on and so forth. So here is an example, A is spam, eggs, 100 and 1, 2, 3, 4. A0 is spam. So you create a list note by the square bracket. Okay. So I can say A is 1, 2, 3, hello, Python, oops. I created a list. A0 will give me the first element minus 3 is 1, 2, 3, 4, minus 2 is 100, this element. The next notion is slices, which I have not done in strings, but the same notion holds. So supposing I want the second um, character to the penultimate character and I want that list. I say A1 colon minus 1, it starts at 1, sorry, which is the first, the second element and ends at the penultimate. Okay. So in this case spam eggs 100 and 1, 2, 3, 4, I get eggs and 100. So this is called slicing. So as an example, here is our string s. I can say what will s 2 or 5 colon minus 1 give me? Space whirl. Now if I want the last guy also, you do not specify the last index. Okay. The same way if I wanted from the first to say the first 5, I get hello. Please note that these are new strings. Each of these is a new string. So slices let you define things like a sub, a sub list or a substring. So you have in this case a colon 2 plus bacon comma 2 star 2, this is another list, right. You can add two lists, if you add two lists you get a new list which is the sum of the two lists. So many of these things are kind of intuitive, so you just experiment with this and you will get the hang of it. The same way as you have multiplication with strings, you can multiply lists also with integers. So if I say 2 into list, it gives me twice that list, basically takes this. So you get in this case, 2 into a colon 3 will be what? What is a colon 3? 0, 1 and 2. So it's spam x and 100, that twice, twice and add to that book. Is that clear? Now lists are mutable. None of these examples I changed the list. I only got elements from the list. I got sub lists, I did not change the list just like I could have done with strings. So I can now say a of 2, what is a of 2? 100, right. So a of 2 is a of 2 plus 23 which means I am setting back this third element which is 100. So the new list becomes spam eggs 1, 2, 3 and 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, you can also replace elements on a list. So if you say a of 0 colon 2, it basically takes out the spam and eggs and replaces that sub list with the new list I have provided. So item assignment works in two ways. You can as assign individual elements, you can assign an entire array or a part of an array. So for example, if I had a here, I wanted to change the entire array in place to say 1, 2, 3, 
I can do that. This will do it. So I say A bracket colon bracket. So by default, if I do not specify something on the left, it starts at 0. If I do not specify something on the right, it is the end. So now A becomes 1, 2, 3. I could have done this as well. And what will this give me? An empty list. So you can assign items individually or on slices. In addition to these kind of things, you can also, there are a bunch of list methods, length of a list of course, it is not a method, but it is a built-in method, built-in function. You can reverse a list in place. When you reverse a list, it does not return a new list, it reverses it in place, which means spam eggs and ham, spam eggs 100, 1, 2, 3, 4 will become 1, 2, 3, 4, 100 eggs in spam, as seen here. You can append elements into a list, so I can say A say 1, 2, 1, 3. So I can say a dot append and I can append a list to it. I can append, okay. So let me append first 4 to it. So a becomes 1, 2, 1, 3, 4. Is that clear? Everybody here with me? Now I can say a dot append I am appending a list. So what do you think will happen now? So you will have a list of lists. So I have 1, 2, 1, 3, 4, 100, 120. I could go in and now say, now how do I access the 120? Okay. So A minus 1 will give me, will give me what? Will give me the last list which is 100, 120. That list in turn I can again access. So I can say minus 1, minus 1 gives me 120. Um, there is another method called extend which given a list will just add the elements of that list into the existing list. So if you look here, if I am extending it 1, 2, it does not append a new list. It actually adds the items of that list here. There is one more thing which I like to do. Supposing I say a dot append a, will this work? It actually does. So I can say a minus 1 and it is a again. The beauty is again go back to notion of a is just a name that is bound to an object. So there is an a, there is this list object sitting there and there is just this name bound to it and there is a reference that can go as long as you want. So you can say a of minus 1, of minus 1, of 0. So it basically works. So that about covers lists as far as this tutorial introduction is. We'll get on with tuples. So lists have methods and I encourage you to go on IPython, create a list, do list that object dot tab, look at all the methods, play around with the methods, experiment, do whatever, the computer is not going to blow up, have fun. Um, tuples are again similar to lists in the sense that they are collections, they are collections of anything but they are immutable, which means I can access them like so, t0, t1, t2, t-1, minus -2, minus -3, minus so on and so forth, but I cannot change them in place, which means once you create a tuple, you are set, you cannot change it. But say t is 1, comma a, it is a tuple, so which means I cannot say t of 0 is 100, I cannot do that. But t of 1 is, t of 0 is what? 0. What about t of 1? It is a. So I can now say t of 1 dot append 1000 and that works. The reason is the object inside that tuple can be changed. That is not immutable. The tuple itself is immutable, but not what it contains. Okay? So this is an important thing. Just because you put something in a tuple, it does not mean you cannot change it. The next very important and pretty fundamental data type in Python is a dictionary. Okay, so dictionaries, think of dictionaries as associative maps. Think of them as arrays not indexed on integers. So let's say I want to create an address book with the index being the name of the person. I would use a dictionary for that. 
Okay. Of course, real programmer probably will use a database for that, but a dictionary is a pretty good starting database. So basically dictionaries are indexed by keys and the keys in this case have to be immutable, is that, is that right? They have to be basically hashable, but let us not get into the details. The basic idea is you can create a dictionary, so let us say dict is a dict ob dictionary object, we will see how to create it. Dict key can be set to a value. Okay. The method keys returns all the keys of that dictionary. The method values returns all the values corresponding to the keys. And the method has key returns if a key is in that particular dictionary. So, okay, examples. So, here we create an example where you have supposedly a telephone directory. And the way you create a dictionary is using curly braces. So this curly and this curly define the dictionary. So you could create an empty dictionary by saying, and that's a dictionary. But in this case, they have been filled out with a few basic values. The key in this case is Jack, and the value is 4098, followed by a comma for the next item, another key, and this. And now you can access the elements by using the key. In this case, there was no key called Guido. So this particular line, tell Guido equals 4127, injects a new key called Guido and assigns the value to 4127, as you can see here. Same way, accessing an existing item in the dictionary is as simple as tell Jack. And you want to remove it, you use del. Del, tell, save. So, I am going to do a simple version. So, if I print d now, I have this. I say del d b. And now d has only a. You can do the same thing with lists, I have not shown it there. Um, tell dot keys give us the keys, so if I say d dot keys, I get a, I can say d, d becomes that. Now I am not restricted to using the keys as only strings, so I could do d of 1 is, that is fine. It works. Okay. So, and I am not restricted to using only a particular type on the right hand side either. Okay. So, you can mix most types. And this is extremely handy. Okay. So, that covers about dictionary. So, let us just do a little bit more about um, the methods. So, it has a bunch of methods. Again, I encourage you to explore this on the interpreter. So, clear will clear remove all the items from D. Um, pop will remove a specified key, d dot values will give me the values as we saw. There is one thing called iter items. So, if I say d dot items, it actually returns a list of, so what is this? This is a list of tuples, each containing key value key value key value okay this is useful we'll use it later but that's about it so you have basic data types numbers booleans none none does nothing it's basically used as a uh, placeholder sometimes and it's used to say a variable is uninitialized and things like that but it really doesn't have any methods or it's an immutable thing which you can't change you have strings you have lists you have tuples and you have dictionaries. So now we have basic data types, we can actually start doing things with Python. We now need to know how to do control flow. And control flow in Python is primarily established using if, elif, else, okay, for loops, while loops and that is it. There are only three looping constructs in Python. If, for and while. 
you in addition to these you have special um, keywords called break continue and else which can be used when you are looping okay finally you have a special keyword called pass so sometimes you want to say if the value of this string is equal to crescent or is equal to iit bombay to this if it is equal to some nonsense do nothing in that case you use a pass you say pass pass will do nothing it will basically uh, it's used when you syntactically need it but you don't want to actually say anything there you want to do nothing it's like it's like doing nothing it's like an empty for loop so because python requires indentation to describe scope you need to put something in there to indent to say that this is that block i want to execute and pass basically is an empty statement so here's the if example and before we get there i'm going to introduce raw input so let's say i want to input something from the user i want i want to write a program where the user is going to have to type some value so you can use what's called raw input please enter a number oops so it prompts me and i can now type in something here it's not a number but it returns the out value you see here is asd asd whatever whatever i typed so it returns a string so i could have as well done this please note it returns a string it does not return a integer it just returns a string whatever the string the user typed but if i want an integer from this how would i get it i can use int of s same way to get floats you use float and it will take the string representation and convert it to a float if possible so what would happen if i said int of 1 what do you think would happen i'll get an exception it will say value error i have no idea how you want me to convert 1 to 1 okay so again note that when you make a mistake you don't get a segmentation fault you are not kicked out of the interpreter you get a clear error message that says you made a mistake fix it and you just continue working okay so now we can get to the if example so i'm basically asking the user for an integer and int converts it to an integer and now i say if x is less than 0 so this is how you do tests so x is less than 0 greater than 0 not equal to 0 all of these are very similar to any other language so i'm not going to belabor that do something and all of this stuff which is indented to the right one level is executed if this is true same way if x is 0 do this do this so you have if elif so if condition colon execute block elif condition colon execute block finally else if all of that fails else colon do whatever else now in addition to this basic if you can also check for whether something is contained in a list or in a dictionary so let's say we have a list called cat window defenestrate and you say if cat in a so a is what a is this list so this is very intuitive syntax if there is a cat in this list you print meow and it does that you could also say if cat not in a so i can say to have a okay so if one in a that works okay on the other hand if i say if 10 not in a print yes it would which is correct there is no 10 in that list the same way with dictionaries you can have if you have a dictionary you can say if crock in pets print pets crock okay is that clear so same way here this in condition only checks for the keys it does not check for the values you could have also done if crock in pets dot keys so let's do that so if 
1 in D that works but I could also say if 1 in values that also works. So basically we have done if now the next thing is for loops so you have again let us say we have a list cat window defenestrate. So for x in a print x comma length of x. So this prints cat 3 window 6 defenestrate 12. So for loop basically follows the structure you have a for which is a keyword x the variable over which you are going to iterate. Okay. So now we saw that you can iterate over a for loop. Please note that the x here, so the for loop starts you say for x in a, right. So what is x? x I have not defined anywhere. So every time you iterate over the elements of that list, x changes from cat to window to defenestrate in sequence, cat, window, defenestrate. So setting up that variable is taken care of by the for. You do not have to declare x is a string type and will be set so and so nothing. You just say for x in a it is done and x does not have to be anything specific. If the item in the list is a list, x becomes a list. The same way you can do this with dictionaries. So you can say for i in d print i this iterates over again the keys. So for example for i in a this a is a list print i prints the elements of the list. D is a dictionary that looks like this for i and d print i gives me the keys of the dictionary. So it is the same kind of notion but often it is not enough if you just have the keys, you also want the values. So let us say you have a dictionary of, of this, I want both the keys and the values. Knights, this dictionary basically has a method called iter items and then you can say k comma v in knights dot iter items. You could also use items, print k comma v. So this is called tuple expansion over here on the left side. So it says so let us do this in little more detail. Let us say I have two variables x comma y. I want to set x comma y to some two values. The way you do it is you will say this is 100 comma 200. It works. The right hand side is a tuple, the left hand side is a tuple. Python understands this and automatically sets x to 100 and y to 200. Okay. So the same thing happens when you do this k comma v in knights dot iter items, iter items iterates over the items which is key value, key value, key value pairs. So every time in the loop you get k comma v being the key and the value. Is that clear? So there are ways to iterate, standard way by which, so two important things you can use if, if something in some container, it could be a list, could be a tuple, it could be a dictionary, it will find if this thing is contained in that. And then you can do for where you say for some variable in some container it will iterate over the elements of that. And for dictionaries you have a special thing called iter items or iter or items which will let you iterate over the key value pairs. Now often when we do calculations we want to iterate over an index, we do not want to iterate over the values. So let us say you have a list of 100 items and you are looking to say I want for i in 1 to 100 get me the values of this. The way in python to do it is to use the range built in. The range built in returns a list starting at by default 0 ending at what you specify here with this particular step. So again I encourage you to say range question mark to look at the documentation but range 5 just for now will give me 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It will not give you the last element. So 
So in this case for i in range 5, print i comma i star i will give me 0 and whatever you see here. Now clearly if you have a string and I want to find the elements of that string and you want to do it like this, let us say I have string as s, how would you do it with this? You would say for i in range length of the string iterate, is that fine? Same idea. So if s is this string for i in range len of string print i comma s of i. Okay. So I have just found the elements of that particular string. The other useful thing with uh, looping is often you have a list and you want both the index and the value. So this is something you will find you need when you are programming and there there is another built in called enumerate. So if you have any iterable you can basically say um, i comma x in enumerate a you get the index and the item. Okay. It is just another looping construct that is useful. Okay. 